Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your anime gourmet hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we've got you covered. Today, John will kick off things by talking about the newest entry in the Index franchise, aka the new season of A Certain Scientific Railgun. Let's hope this one turned out better than the newest season of Index itself. After that, I will take a look at the cyberpunk adventures of a literal smoking gun in the appropriately titled No Guns Life. And finally, we will wrap things up with one of our favorite long-running series, Food Wars, by discussing its final two seasons, the fourth and fifth plate. Sounds like quite the multi-course anime menu to digest, so maybe don't gulp it down all at once and try to savor it instead. But if you feel up to it, don't pause the pod. We'll be right back. So, we're back. I'm back. Real Dex is back. Oh boy. Um, I Index 3 was a mess. <laughs> we, we, we went over that. Seemed like and, it, yeah. And I'm going to spare you all a long talk about what Real Dex is once again, because I believe when I talked about Index 3, I ran down... Most of what Railgun is as well, the, sh the long and short of it is it starts off as kind of a prequel to Index and then as the story moves along it sort of becomes more like a side story because we see the parallels to this, to the quote unquote main story in Index sort of uh, form between the two series. So hmm. that's the TLDR <laughs> of, of it and I'm not going to waste my time, I'm not going to waste your time running down everything that's come before it. Railgun T starts off at the beginning of the Daihase Festival, which is a, uh, sort of brings me to one of my issues with the series that I'll touch on in a minute. Um, oh, good start. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not on the show itself, but it's on another aspect. Okay. Uh, so the Daihase Festival is underway in the prestigious Tokiwadai Middle School, where the ace of the school, yeah, Mikoto Misaka, resides, is one of the schools participating in this annual sports fest. However, not, not everything is fun and games, as people behind the shadows start to plot a new threat that will endanger everyone in the whole academy city. And after the da, Daihe... It's, uh, this is my problem with it. After the Dai Hase Festival, Mikoto and her friends find themselves being involved in multiple incidents surrounding special cards that supposedly record people's dreams. Issue number one out the gate. There's translation problems with this show. I know Crunchyroll subbers don't get paid a lot, and I'm sorry. I feel you. I don't get paid much at my job either. But there's some, par there's some parts of this show where it's like why are some of these things translated with the way they are why are some of them not so in japanese it's just called the the daiha seisai which kind of rolls off the tongue better and i'm not saying to keep that name call it i, I don't fucking know i'm pulling this out of my ass right now the sports star festival boom easy mm -hmm. done the fact that they keep calling it, you know, a half English, half Japanese name as the series goes on, just it rubbed me the wrong way. I can and see that, why. And that's not that is not on the writing of the show. It's not on the presentation, but it's like just just pick one or the other. Just stop. So fuck it, I'm gonna call it the name I gave it before. The, the Sports Star Festival is something that was a plot element in Index. Ooh, I think it was Index 2. Um, and it's just this big, as the name implies, sport inter-school sports festival where everyone's there to uh, do their big thing and show off, you know, who in this city of nerds is the most uh, athletically capable? Because let's be real, that's what Academy City is. And there's, there's some real weird shit going on where uh, one of the... Uh, character Saten is big into the rumor mill and the urban legends that surround uh, Academy City and she catches wind of this weird thing called shadow metal. Love it. Basically. Listening to it all the time. 
<laughs> nobody knows what the hell that is. And uh, when Satin sort of goes on t- to her own investigation, turns into some weird shenanigans, but it ultimately turns out to be nothing. Or does it? And a lot of this uh, plot revolves around a character who we saw very briefly in Railgun X, uh, Mies X, Railgun S. This is the problem with putting just a single letter after your show's name. It's kind of like uh, the, uh, the Index franchise, or at least the Railgun franchise, is trying to adhere to the new Xbox naming structure, which is very oh my confusing. God, you're not even wrong. Like, it was index one, two, three. Okay, cool. Hey, what does Railgun S stand for? Railgun Sisters. Okay, fine. That was would, I would have the plot. I would have assumed Railgun Second and... That would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. What is, hey, what does Railgun T stand for? Railgun th- the Third or Three or... So they kind of are very coy about it up until the last episode where they oh, put no. up on the screen a certain scientific railgun third season. And I was just like, fuck you, that's what it stood for. God damn it. <laughs> of course. Oh. Because, you know, every other show that has a letter after it means, you know, it means something. Dumb. something. Yeah. It, it means more than nothing, at least. Yeah. But yeah, uh, right. Misaki was briefly introduced in Railgun S. That's the right letter. And we sort of see that she has these mind control powers, but we see her for maybe two episodes and then that's it. That's all. She kind of gets uh, put on the back burner. Well, in uh, the first half of Railgun T, it turns out that, hey, so there's this weird shit going on with her mind control powers where someone else is trying to use, where there's this, uh, this scientist dude who's trying to use them for his own gain. And he comes along and Misaki has, has her own big problems, you know, it, cause he comes across as very haughty, very princess, like kind of half a step short of, you know, having the hand up to the mouth with the ho, 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 ho laugh. Mm, mm, okay. Car- there's another Karen classic. There's another character who does that. <laughs> so don't worry. The bases are covered. But yeah, Misaki was sort of this mystery to me. And I wanted to know more about her for a long time. So we kind of, we get to see a lot more about her in this uh, season. And I thought she was a really sort of interesting character because, she, you know, she comes across as very, like I said, haughty, very up on her own or up on herself but she's not sort of doing things without a purpose we see that you know there is um, an end to her means and at one point when she erases she erases the memory of all of uh, mikoto's friends and that comes across as yo bitch what the fuck did you do to my friends and it turns out we find out she did that so that Mikoto's friends would, you know, not get involved with uh, her own bullshit, which is sort of like, that's a weird way to go about things, but it was at least somewhat well-intentioned. I guess, but also it took the control out of their hands, which is kind of, I don't know, uh, a bit backwards or, you know, maybe leave it up to them to get involved or not. Uh, uh, yeah. it's, it's anime. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I know. I'm asking too much. <laughs> um. But, I mean, the weird thing is, I mean, the thing is with even something weird like that, Railgun is still more straightforward than Index could ever hope to be. That's a good thing. So, yes, yes. It's not bending over backwards to be strange the way Railgun is. Because real to be Index, Index, Jesus. Ugh. So, you know, it's doing its own thing in its own weird ways, but it's it's not being stupid to be stupid because with Index, you know, we, we've we talked about – I talked about this at length. It has even weirder pseudo-religio-science magic that doesn't really quite add up. And Railgun is just – yeah, this is just, you know, it's – it's an action show with, you know, your dose of cute girls on the side, I guess, if that's what you want. But yeah, the the story with uh, Misaki is interesting. And it's what I was wanting to get from Railgun S. 
So seeing more of the character I was interested in and having it not feel like it was sort of shoved in as a side story to a side story felt pretty good. Hey, we get to see a little bit of our good friend Toma as things go along, too. So, hey, hmm. nice. Cool. Cameos. Gotta love yeah. it. There's even a fun little bit where uh, they let Toma read one of the uh, episode previews and he capped it off <laughs> like an index episode preview. And one of the other characters he's reading it with is like, y you're not allowed to say that on this show. <laughs> so th nice. that's pretty th – that's nice. That's fun. Uh, if we get to see a lot more of Kuroko being cool this time – and I, 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 way back when the show was airing, I linked you a pretty awesome clip of a fight between her and one of the other characters where they're tr we're sh they're trying to play 4D chess against one another. And instead of teleporting out of the way to play into th this other girl's hands, Kuroko takes a knife to the hand and just says, fuck you, I'm going to just kick you in the face. Yeah, it was a great scene. Yeah, it was like really good. Which brings me to talking about Boy, this show had at least a marginally larger budget than Index 3 did because it consistently looks really good. And I don't know if that's, you know, because the Railgun was always directed by someone else, uh, namely Tatsuyuki Nagai, who's worked on um, a fair share of Gundam stuff, Double uh, O Age, Iron Blood. Um, so I guess. He, he knows, knows his way around action. Yeah, he knows his way around action and how to and how to keep the story from turning into a fucking train wreck because mm -hmm. it this didn't feel like forty episodes shoved into twenty the way Index Three did. And I hate that that's the goddamn barometer we're going off of because Index up to that point was fine, and then Three came along and just he is everything. Shat, it just shat the bed because and. Uh, a mutual friend of ours brought up the point that it seemed like they cared a lot more about Railgun to begin with. And yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they had more, they had more writers on anyway. They had like five, four people writing it and one whose name I believe will come up again later in this show. So also, you know, the same studio, JC Staff, which <sighs> JC Staff, uh, man, there are times where they put in the work and then there's times where they call in like the second, third and fourth string team. This was this was I feel like it was um, probably between the first and second string team, because, you know, as you go along, you see. You know, there's some moments where it's a little rough, but all in all, the production on the show is fine. It works out. It doesn't really go too far off the uh, <laughs> rails. Ah. <laughs> and I would say it always comes down to, to the direction. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, something like Food Wars we're going to talk about later. It's also not like, I would say, in terms of actual animation handled by maybe the best JC Steph has to offer, but, you know, mm -hmm. the... the the art direction and uh, the actual direction of the show is pretty damn strong, so it manages to compensate for a lot of those short uh, animation shortcomings. So, you know, it always depends on who you get to do what show and if they actually know what they're fucking doing. And it seems like for Railgun, they got the right guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess... I guess as is the motto of this year, it is what it is. But, <laughs> you know... It's, Every studio is going to have their ups and downs. Some Obviously, just have yeah. more than others. But uh, yeah, so after the whole uh, dealing with uh, Misaki and her and her mental powers getting manipulated for the best, you know, for the worst of things, and basically what turns out to be a rescue mission for a friend of hers, we sort of come across this subplot where Kuroko meets up with this kid who's a precog named Shae, and he uh, he uses a Polaroid camera to take pictures of his uh, these precognitions, and he posts photos of these uh, precognitions to this app online. And when Kuroko and the other members of Judgment happen across this, and Kuroko finds that she's able to, you know, 
keep these precognitions from coming true, she's approached by Cheyenne and says, wow, you know, I thought, you know, all of these futures were absolute and they work together and they had this, you know, great character moment between the two of them. And it's like character development for Kuroko because up to this, up to this point, she's been a, a pretty one note character. She can, oh, she can teleport around and, you know, the whole, oh, nay, sama sort of mm-hmm. thing going on that she's got. Um, I, I posed with my arms around me because we don't have cameras to convey that. <laughs> Um, which brings me to the next translation foible that's really weird. They chose to translate Onesama as sissy. Oh, boy. I, I mean, it didn't bug me a lot. It bugged, it, some, it, it bugged someone we know. Yes, the same mutual friend I talked about before. Um, I mean, I, f- I didn't feel like it was the wrong choice, but I also felt like mm, maybe there's other ways you could have chosen to translate that that didn't seem so odd. It sounds really weird, yeah. I yeah, mean, that's, 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 nobody would use that word. It, like, no. Name one person that would use the word sissy when talking to about a friend they're really smitten with. Like, that sounds, that sounds so fucking out there. Like, do you even English? And I say that as a German guy. So, yeah. And I mean, the problem is there's no real direct way to translate a phrase. Yeah, that's why you have to think around them. You do, for most of these, you know, things like Onesan, Onichan, whatever, Aniki, you don't, you can't really use, there are not necessarily, maybe bro or something like that, or sis in certain cases, but sometimes you just have to use the name of the people, uh, the names of the people that they're talking to. Like give them nicknames or something, give them, abbreviate their names if they mm-hmm. want to show affection uh, between those two characters. Like let her call her, um, well, what's, what's, what's her real name, Misaka? Mikasa? Misaka, Mikoto. Call her Mimi or something, or Miko, Miko or something like that. Like shorten her name, do something like that. It makes more sense than using <laughs> fucking sissy, which is, what, what the hell is that? Yeah, uh, yeah, and I mean... Hmm. Mm. Oh, right. I forgot about the other translation thing. Um, they were real fixated on the title card for the show about calling it a certain magical railgun for a few episodes. And it's like, mm, guys, it's, it's not the name of the show. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> hey, one can get confused. I mean, that yeah. universe is, is like encompasses three different series at this point. Oh, yeah, it does. Two of this on the scientific side and one on the magical side. So maybe the translator were, weren't uh, happy with that and wanted to give Railgun a bit more on the magical edge. I mean, there's some weird magic science kind of going on later in this uh, season with an arc called the Dream Ranker, where there are these playing cards that they refer to as Indian poker, where the cards are infused with the memories of other people. And if you fall asleep with one of the cards on your head, you'll be imbued with the skills that are etched into that card. And only in your dreams or only in your dreams. Uh, Well, yeah. And (laughs) it's a little out there a lot out there but hey you know what that's fine because it sort of is there's this scientist uh ryoko kuriba who's basically using this as a means of disseminating you know knowledge to people because she it's hard to explain really because it was part of an experiment with cyborg technology where the the thought was trying to imbue robotics with uh souls and uh boy that can't go wrong and it you know it turns out where hey tldr we end up having to stop this uh robot who has a soul that turns out to be like yeah uh this isn't what i wanted for myself so i'm just gonna you know use the knowledge that i'm imbued with to just kind of you know destroy academy city no big deal whatever sure Makes sense. But there, there's this other angle to it where it's like, you know, what happens to the soul when uh, someone dies? Blah, blah, blah. Like I said, pseudoscience. But, you know, they, I'm not doing it justice here, mostly because I don't want to spend an hour and a half talking about it like I did with Index. But, you know, they make it work out in the context of the story. And it's it's fine. It is what it is. I will say, though, that after Index 3, Boy, this was a breath of fresh air. <laughs> I can imagine. 
Production wise just, alone. Production, yes. Uh, just on the production. And you didn't have to think too hard about the story. You know, it was, again, easier to follow. It didn't feel like it was going 150 miles an hour every episode. Because, you know, again, you know, oh my God, it didn't. F- it didn't need to. It, it, it didn't need to cram four stories into two seasons. It was like two big stories and then a couple of smaller side stories that, you know, helped balance everything out. Um, there's a small side story in there where Satan runs across one of the uh, girls from uh, Item, a kind of sort of not terrorist group that uh, is a thing more prevalently in index three where they run across this girl who can snipe people with mind bullets. You may insert your tenacious D reference here. And Satan runs across uh Frenda from item. And, you know, they sort of hit it off and they have this, this weird offbeat friendship where they bond over curry. <laughs> and one day, I you mean, know, why not? Yeah. And, you know, they go back and forth in uh, text messages and getting to know each other. And then one day Frenda just stops texting her back in that the point in index where Mugi no offed Frenda. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. And, that and, sucks. And you, you as the viewer realize that and you're like, oh no. <laughs> I mean, is there is there like a payoff to that later in the show or is it just like, oh, no. weird. Not responding no, anymore. That's the end of the story and it's like, oh, that's... Oh, God. Because Satan doesn't know that, but... Having the knowledge from Index, you know, you the viewer, the mm. reader know that, and it's like, oh, that's kind of sad. Yeah, that's <laughs> wow. Okay, that's kind of mean, but also well done, I guess. If you consume yeah. all of the stuff, right? Yeah. So there's no, I guess, I guess there doesn't need to be closure for Satan because she doesn't know. Why yeah. should she know? Yeah. So you know, it, 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 they make it work out like that pretty well so and it, and if you know the story you know what happens and it's like oh okay you know we, we you get that but yeah index are the fuck <laughs> they might as well just be the same franchise at this point i mean they are but they're not railgun t the long and short of it was it was it was really it was really good it was again a breath of fresh air and it was a fun watch and it was neat to see you know going back to the science side to get some of the details that I wanted that we hadn't gotten before and um, and some of the uh, side stuff that plays into the main story as, as well. Because, you know, we see little bits of interplay as the story goes along, but, you know, seeing it, some of the close ends come in that we hadn't gotten in Index was pretty cool. So the problem with it is, you know, you can you can watch and enjoy Railgun on its own, and, and you can also watch and enjoy Index on its own. <laughs> but the problem is one is kind of required viewing for the other at this point. Yeah, kind of like the Marvel, Marvel movies. It's like, hey, yeah. you can enjoy them on like one by one or, you know, basis or as singular movies, but it enhances the experience uh to you know watch all of them and also if by the point you get to avengers endgame or something like that you're like why why would you watch that if you haven't watched the other movies you will have no idea what the fuck is going on here so <laughs> oh man bro i'm gonna go watch infinity war what what are these stones man yeah <laughs> that's like a quick side note was a bunch of the people I work with, we uh, went and saw Infinity War. And I, I the only Marvel movie I had watched up to that point was Iron Man. And I was like, I got homework. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. I, I didn't watch everything, but I watched like five or six movies. I watched like the essentials. So when I went in to watch Infinity War, I was able to point at the screen and be like, ha ha, I know that thing. <laughs> Ah, the feeling of superiority. You are a more, <laughs> more well knowledge <laughs> nerd. <laughs> like that. Um, <laughs> I will always go back to this, that episode of Red Letter Media. I saw it and I clapped. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no. Railgun T was. It was a lot of fun. It gave me a lot of what I was looking for from the um, previous series, and it was again a lot better produced 
uh, you know, the story was not a jumbled, hyper sped up mess. If you've watched everything else up to this point, I'm sure you're probably going to watch this too. So I don't know how to recommend this if you have if you're not already in there. So, you know, if you're already up to this point, yeah, it's an enjoyable watch. If you're not, yeah, it's an enjoyable watch asterisk. <laughs> Could one but, only watch the railgun side of things and get enough out of it? Or would you say railgun alone doesn't do the trick by the, uh, at this point? Yeah, you could. I mean, yeah. You could enjoy the science side without the bits of magic side. But when, you know, when the bits of the magic side start to sort of seep in and you have questions, hmm. I mean, I guess you could read a summary or something without having to watch sure. the magic side. But yeah, uh, Rogan T, good time. I, I I I was at the beginning not sure I would stick with it, and I ended up sticking it out, and I liked it. If you want to watch it, it's on Funimation, Crunchyroll, Verve, 2B TV, and yeah, have yourself a watch with a electric charged girl with railgun powers, and have a good time. In the near future, many humans have become cyborgs called Extended. However, with the Great War having recently ended, many Extended who are former soldiers begin to resort to crime to survive. Juzo Inui is a Resolver, an Extended mercenary who specializes in solving problems caused by other Extended. His life is turned upside down when a renegade Extended breaks into his office, pleading for him to protect a young boy named Tetsuru Arahabaki. As it turns out, that Extended is being controlled by Tetsuro himself, who was the subject of shady experiments run by the sinister Berühren operation. Juzo takes on the job of protecting Tetsuro from the grasp of Berühren, and together with a trusted mechanic slash sidekick called Mary, he is not only forced to fight hitmen, terrorists and other criminals, but also to confront the shadows of his own past. Nogan's life is based on a manga by Tasuku Karasuma, which started in 2014, is still running and currently counts 11 volumes. The anime series ran for 24 episodes and was produced by Madhouse, which we have mentioned so many times on the mm -hmm. show. that I don't need to recount their entire long and storied production history here again. Some of my personal highlights of theirs would be Ninja Skull, Vampire Hunter D, Bloodlust, Black Lagoon, the Hunter Hunter remake, Redline and One Punch Man. The director of No Gun's Life is Naoyuki Ito, who also directed the fifth season of Digimon, an episode of the Recuity Honey OVA, and recently Overlord, among a lot of other things uh, that he worked on. And the animation of No Gun's Life is decent. Mm. We have often talked about how Madhouse is not the powerhouse they used to be anymore. A lot of promising people went off to do their own things. Some of them went and founded MAPPA, for example. And productions like One Punch Man were only possible because the director Shingo Natsume called in a boatload of freelance favors. So yeah, don't expect any big Sakuga moments in No Gun's life. The action scenes are rich in details in terms of actual drawings, but are very slow and limited. You have some decent impact blows and explosions and stuff like that, but there is not that much actual animation going around, aside from maybe the CG, which is pretty good. It's mostly used for machinery, which there is a lot of in the show, naturally, since this is a cyberpunk noir detective story. And speaking of the noir atmosphere, despite its limited animation, the art in the show actually manages to convey that very well. We've got a lot of dimly lit streets, corridors and offices, sometimes partially illuminated by neon billboards and stuff like that. It's all very cool, heavily inspired by Blade Runner and the like, of course, but also infused with a very distinctive body horror vibe especially when it comes to some of the extended. The soundtrack also emphasizes the noir feeling magnificently. It was composed by a little upcoming hotshot composer named Kenji Kawai, who's oh, only, that guy. <laughs> only credit so far <laughs> are these little productions called Ghost in the Shell, Pet Labor, Mob Psycho 100, Gundam 00, Run My Half, uh, the original Fate Stay Night, Joker Game, Come Rider Build, and a bunch of live action movie scores. He's one of the greats, of course, I'm only joking mm. around, and he shows it in this production as well. Um, a lot of the quieter, moody scenes are underlined with jazz tunes. 
that are heavy on the sexy sax mm -hmm. and uh, the more action and drama driven stuff is enriched by his brand of orchestra and rock infused compositions. It's a fucking great soundtrack and I would love to listen to it outside of the show but so far the only release was with the third Blu-ray box of the show and it's nowhere to be found on any streaming services like Spotify or YouTube Music or stuff like that or any other places online for that matter. So that kind of sucks for me anyway for the people who bought that box set good on them. Please I mean, rip that thing. I was supposed to say maybe it'll show up online eventually. Yeah, we'll see. It, I think it was released uh, at the beginning or middle or end of September. I'm not sure, but yeah. Should have found its way online by now, but it hasn't. So I'm kind of worried. But yeah, it's a great soundtrack. Uh, the second OP, Chaos Drifters by Hiroyuki Sabano and the lead singer of Man with a Mission, uh, John Ken Johnny, is also fantastic and one of the bangers of this season. And yeah. The story of No Gun's life is what I'd call a slow burn. It takes its time to introduce a lot of different characters and side characters and their personal stories. Many of them don't seem that important. Also, it seems to constantly fuck around with case of the week episodes instead of moving the plot forward, at least in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But starting with the second half, it becomes more focused and the aforementioned case of the week story beats that happened early on in the show actually delivers some decent callbacks and payoffs for the main plot, at least some of them. And thankfully, some of the characters in the show are pretty neat and help to get over the slow starting hurdles. First and foremost, Juzo, who is an incredibly cool looking main character, if I might say so myself. <laughs> I mean, the guy's job description is that of a resolver and his head is literally a revolver, which uh, comes across as very goofy in the beginning. I mean, he's just a dude, normal dude with a fucking gun for a head. But once you warm up to the design choice, it's pretty damn neat. They even managed to give him a lot of personality by having him have these comedic as detoned reaction faces, which are pretty adorable. <laughs> Which is weird to say about that guy, but still, it's it's adorable. He like he freaks out about certain things and then gets these super uh, cute deformed gun face. Which yeah, it's kind of great. It's kind of great. He has to smoke a lot because the tobacco relieves some of the stress on his extensions, which of course fits very well into the classic private eye noir atmosphere. Those guys were always smoking. He also has this long trench coat, at least in the first half of the show. He has some neat special attacks, one of the major ones being called Funke Faust, which should really be Funken Faust if you want to be anal about it, where he loads the small revolver barrel on his fist with bullets to power up his punch. Yo. Yo, it's kind of like, so like, kind of like a bullet punch. It's really cool. <laughs> Not a gun blade, a gun fist. But there's also some other weirdest, weirder stuff later on in the show, which uh, relates to his setup as a living weapon. His strongest weapon and biggest weak point actually is the trigger on his gun head and he will only let someone touch it who he has accepted as a person. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, subtle this show is mm. not and it becomes pretty clear where they will go with that pretty quickly. And overall Juzo is just a pretty cool guy, not in terms of just visuals and behavior, just he's a strong dude with a good moral code, he's very sympathetic but not too straightforward to become boring. Naturally, he has a troubled past, mainly, but not only due to what he did uh, and experienced in the war, but he and his story were definitely the high point of the show, in my opinion. I enjoyed Juzo as a character a lot. And he has at least two or three fuck yeah fist in the air moments in this series. He's, he's just a great badass. I think he was pretty damn cool. Mary Steinberg, uh, the uh, mechanic, is also pretty great. She is very brash. Uh, has a foul mouth on her, likes to tease Juzo and Tetsuro a lot, but she's also very clever, capable and sympathetic in her own right. She's the super gifted mechanic that can work wonders on Injured Extended. Although, in a later episode she gets shot in the foot and needs to see a doctor because according to Juzo she doesn't know how to fix a flesh wound. Like, what? <laughs> Like, she's able to transplant whole mechanical body parts and attach them to human tissue, but she doesn't know how to treat a bullet wound. That doesn't make a lick of sense to me, but what do I know about medicine? It's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, her background story and that of her lost brother Victor is also one of the more interesting ones in the show. 
She's also not as permanently sexualized as she could have been, considering how lewd and raunchy the show tends to get once in a while in regards to certain character models and how they behave. So that's pretty neat. I liked her a lot as a character, and she was a great addition to the cast, in my opinion. Had a lot of fun with her. And her dynamic with uh, with Juzo gets really good later on, and like her, their personal interaction, personal story, and how that is actually interlinked, because there's a lot more there than you initially expect. Uh, it's pretty damn cool. The boy, Tetsuro, that Juzo in the beginning of the show agrees to protect, also has a pretty good arc, mainly in the second part of the series, although it's not even remotely finished by the time the show wraps up, sadly. But his story is mostly about trying to unearth his past because, you know, he has lost his memory due to the experiments. So it's about finding out how Berühren came to experiment on him, who he was before that and so on. Uh, he is very headstrong initially, so he tries to do things his own way, which tends to get him into trouble and is the reason he butts heads uh, with uh, Juzo ever so often. But thankfully it doesn't make him annoying and instead serves as a learning experience that develops his character in a slow but steady way. And then there are a bunch of colorful side characters like Juzo's landlady Christina, a dude at his barber shop and his daughter. We also have Olivier who really needs to lay off the blue lipstick and Cronin who really likes his car. Uh, and they work for EMS, which is the government agency that apprehends and imprisons Renegade Extended. And of course, we have a plethora of villains. Most of them are hitmen of Berühren and later the terrorist organization Spitzbergen, who is ostensibly this fanatic anti-extended group. So we have Cunningham on the side of Berühren, who is like this small, fat, slimy lackey of the higher echelon of Berühren, who has a face that was just drawn to be punched into a mush eventually, or at least I hope that will happen. You have Victor, who enters the picture later, but like I said, is Mary's brother, and besides having a very peculiar psychological disposition, he is also one of the creepier and cooler extended, since a lot of the extended designs are actually more weird and freaky than actually cool or scary. Just to give you an example, the show's version of a pet dog is a robot hand with legs. Uh... Yeah, a jank-ass body horror version of Metal Gear from Snatcher or MGS4. And it's called Lefty, of course. Of course it is. <laughs> That's the kind of weird design aesthetic we're dealing with here on a regular basis. But yeah, there are also at least some cool or creepy designs in there. Victor being one of them. The other I don't want to give away because it's kind of a spoiler. I mean, Victor is too, but it's not. Once Mary mentions him, you're pretty sure that he's still alive and somewhere out there and he's going to come into the picture soon enough, so it's not really a spoiler. And then there are Pepper and Seven, which are basically the mirror to Juzo and his two buddies. Seven is also a gun slave extended, just like Juzo, and Pepper is one of the children from the orphanage Berühren set up as a front for their experiments. That's where Tetsuro fled from. And their backstory is super dark and horrible, like a lot of the background stuff in the series is. But yeah, they and Juzo face off several times in the show and kind of serve as the catalyst for the big finale. So they are pretty important, even though they don't have a direct connection to Juzo or Mary or Tetsuro and are basically just a tag team muscle for Cunningham and Berühren with a troubled past. And yeah, I thought this show was pretty decent once it got going. Problem is, like I mentioned before, it takes its sweet time to do so. And also, nothing is wrapped up by the end. Spitzbergen might be done for, but somehow I doubt it. Seven might also return to the scene eventually. We don't know anything about Kronen. Victor is still out and about. We still don't know Tetsuro's and Juzo's entire backstory. And let's not forget, the gang hasn't really been making even a dent in Berühren's long-term plans. Not even Schudelkin, excuse me, Cunningham, seems to have bitten the dust yet, as it seems. So yeah, if there isn't another season that adapts more of the manga, this would be a wholly unsatisfying endpoint of the story. Um, which is the main reason I can't really recommend this show at this point. If you are okay with watching 24 episodes of anime and then switching to the manga, sure, have a go at it. Like I said, slow start, but it eventually gets good and becomes a rather satisfying watch. 
by the end the show actually also takes a nice stance against the old I was just following orders sentiment very much appreciated but if you want to go anime only I'd say wait until they announce at least another season because the story only just started and then it immediately ends it feels like this was the prequel to the actual story which you could also say about the adaption of Vinland Saga and we don't know if that will ever get another season either but I'd also say Vinland Saga has more to offer in the character and animation department to merit a watch regardless of its future. I can't necessarily say the same thing about No Gun's life. Although, meandering parts aside, I had some fun with it. But if this is all we get, it's not even remotely enough in my opinion. So yeah, that's it for No Gun's Life. Very short review, not much to say about it without going into spoilers. Like I said, Due to it being so meandering in the first half and the story not really going a lot of places yet, there is not much to talk about. There is some interesting character development for Juzo, for Mary, uh, partially for Tetsuro, but that's kind of it. Maybe a bit for Pepper and Seven. Very, very little stuff at the end there, at the la in the last two episodes. But aside from that, there's not much to talk about this show. It's like it's a Monster of the Week show for its first half, kind of, or Case of the Week. And then it kind of gets into the plot ever so slowly. But aside from that, it's just a pretty decent science fiction cyberpunk action show with some cool characters in there, mainly Juzo, who's just a fucking cool guy. If that's enough for you, check it out. Uh, if you're like, nah, I want to feel, I want to experience the entire story, read the manga or watch the anime and then switch over to the manga. But for now, that story is not even remotely finished. And so that's the reason I cannot recommend this show as it is right now, even though I had a good time with it. That's anyway, bad. yeah, that's how it turns out sometimes. I don't know if we'll get mm. another season. Nothing has been announced yet. If you are interested in this season, you can check it out on Funimation or Hulu in the United States, I think, and on Anime On Demand in Germany. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> check out if, if, the, if the designs and the mood and the atmosphere of the show is like enough to pull you in despite its sluggish pacing in the beginning maybe give it a go and then switch over to the manga or wait for another season if not uh, i can't blame you for not um, watching it all the way through because there are very very few payoffs for what it does in its first season by the time it wraps up for now i got nothing more to add so i'll end with the subtitle of no guns life because it perfectly conveys the show's ridiculous nature science fiction hard-boiled the Gunsmoke Drifts Muzzle Talks. Perfect. So, here we are at the end of things. It's the last review of the episode, and it's, I presume, one of the last times we'll talk about food wars. Unless there comes a movie on OVA around, yeah, probably. I mean, there was a uh, an epilogue manga I think called Le Desert. So well, they partially we'll get to that, but they partially already put that into the show. Yeah. Mm. So it kind of just picks up exactly where we left off at the end of season three, part two, with uh, the team Shokugeki. Yeah, it's been a minute since we talked about it because you know. <laughs> things happened covid happened hi mm. hello hi <laughs> hi <laughs> but yes this is uh, season four will be the conclusion to that between the uh the totsky rebel students going up against they're fighting the system man they're fighting mm. this, uh central we don't want to be part of you, what you got going on we want to do our own thing man fuck you <clears throat> city arena's dad but yes, it, that all this all culminates in a big old shook geck up against the uh, the rest of the elite ten council. Um, yes, a team shokugeki, which was kind of the the interesting uh, new aspect of the whole tournament they uh, were doing, or you know, the the finale of that, which is like, hey, you actually. You got a couple of cooks cooking against uh, another couple of cooks, basically, doing the cook-off. And not just one-on-one -on -one matches. I still kind of take issue with the fact that this should have been called the third plate part three. 
I guess, yeah. It's kind of weird that they split it up there and then decided, well, now it's the fourth and not part three. It's <laughs> Why not like, call part, part two a fourth plate then? It was like, a bit weird. If you even look at the credits for season five, the committee is called Shokugeki no Soma Production Committee Part 4. Weird. <sighs> it is weird. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like you said, this is basically uh, a wrap up of that what happened up to that point in the third season. We have like this this duel between the two factions. We got Central headed by Azami, Erina's dad on the one side, who is trying to have this, uh, I don't know, this kind of... The, the, let's say the, the Nazi metaphor is very strong, strong with that guy, at least in a way, like into how it's all this kind of militarized organization where it's like, hey, everything is, needs to be the same. We're all cooking like the same way and the same shit. So nobody gets left on the wayside. I mean, his intentions, as it later turns out, kind of were good in a way, also selfish in a way, but still. But the way he goes about it is really shitty because, you know, no individualism allowed. Everybody mm. has to be the same, right? So, um, yeah, that's on the one side and everyone of, on the rebels who has been outcast and their student visa have been uh, taken in by, by the Elite Ten and stuff like that. It's like, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, we ra we'd rather get expelled from Totsuki Academy. So, yeah, there's a bunch of Shokugekis and uh, on the side we have the different characters developing through that and uh you know uh most for first and foremost Irina I would say this kind of becomes her story just on the virtue it being about uh the bad guy being her dad mm. and uh then of course Soma who also uh, tries to grow as a cook through his experience and also help his friends to get stronger and we get a lot of faces we've seen before participating in this on the one side and the elite 10 on the other side and then you have a bunch of different st cooking styles on both sides uh, who are infused with certain characters for the elite 10 we have like uh this this one girl i forget her name who always cooks like these very cute and sweet things and mm. we got rindo who is specialist for uh, for rare ingredients and uh, butchers and uh, a live alligator on stage. <laughs> yeah, <oof. laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> we got uh, Tafelweiss Ritter. <laughs> so oh, awesome. man. Uh, which, you know, Crunchyroll appropriately uh, retranslated as um, Weiser Ritter der Tafel, which makes more sense. Yes, actually. But yeah, who has this very elegant, uh, stylish way of cooking and has just like this giant as greater as the size of a broadsword. And, you know, the things you would expect from co Food Wars. Colorful characters cooking very extravagant meals in a very um, over-exaggerated way and uh, people losing their clothes when, when tasting that stuff. <laughs> and orgasming. Don't, don't forget that. Food, or, food orgasms are real, didn't you know that? Yeah, apparently, yes. At least in this show. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. And that's what happens in the fourth season. I honestly feel like the fourth season was at this was probably this show at its strongest because you know it's a big any time in this show everything turns anything turns out to be a big team effort you get to see all the warriors coming together and it just you know feels good like at the very end of this when soma is like hey come on do the thing that i do and she arena throws her hand up in the same way and just goes oh sumats i was just like mm, so good it was super yeah. cathartic, and I liked it, and I, I loved it, and it was just this great moment for her. And I was like, ah, oh. yeah. you know, Arena's had a hard life, so seeing her get this this big, big win was great. Yeah, it was great, and it was a great turn for the character, you know, who comes across in the very beginning of the show as kind of like this a bit stuck up bitch, <laughs> a bit. Yeah. I'm being I'm being overly mean, but you know, a bit a bit arrogant, you know, being like, hey, here, I have my god tongue, I I am the gourmet expert, I can tell when something tastes good and, uh, and when something doesn't, and then Soma with his very basic cooking in the beginning, but nonetheless, uh, nonetheless super delicious cooking, uh, managed to, uh, manages to pull her off her high horse. And then the story continues, <laughs> and as we later learn, that was not really a coincidence, and yeah, so it's great. Like you have, like you said, her stuff is great, and how that relates to her relationship with her father—that's the most uh, emotionally satisfying aspect of this show. 
Mm. Um, but also seeing why her father did it and how Somas and his dad figure into that whole picture and everything it works. We have some great moments for uh, for some of the side characters uh, in there. Like we have Megumi who does like this training montage that is drawn in this very uh, old sports manga-esque st style. Yes. With 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 uh, the coach from the Stagiare, um, and they become the legume duo, or what it's called. He's the coach, and she's she's the, uh, the trainee, and uh, it's it's very great. Like it's it's super entertaining, and it shows um, what's one of the best things about the show, which is the presentation, which is like in theory, like on paper, this should be the most boring show in existence because it's basically just a character explaining how they cooked a meal. Like, doing this extended, long fucking monologue. Like, this is exposition dump. How they fucking prepared this food. <laughs> and then someone tastes it and says, like, hey, yeah, it's super tasty. So on paper, <laughs> without knowing what is actually happening in the show, it's like, wow, this sounds super boring. But then you add to that all the ridiculousness that happens, uh, that happens, all the visual metaphors that happen in the show, and all the anime nonsense, and it becomes super fun. Like, what are some of the highlights in this fourth season? Like, there's an elephant and a crocodile breathing lasers at each other, <laughs> for example. Like I said, there's the sports manga stuff. There's a bunch of martial arts or sword fighting scenes between the different cook characters who uh, inhabit that kind of style or that that lends itself to that imagery one of them is kind of like has like this giant knife or, or uh, which it's basically a sword or he handles it like a sword and then he has a sword fight with soma uh, in in a meta metaphorical sense not really <laughs> when, mm. but when they when they have their cook off you know but it's it's super cool and the presentation is not stop in your face with its ridiculousness dialed up to at least 11 that you are never bored and yeah you will however become very hungry because mm -hmm. that's also one of the things the food always looks super delicious in this like there's which was so much work put into making this shit look great and sound great the soundtrack is fantastic again a different mutual friend of ours he enjoyed earlier on in the series when they were kind of getting into the gastronomical stuff like this yeah. is how these flavors and these things play together and the show kind of got away from that i guess because they had a chef on staff for this show but only for like the first season so then after that, it sort of became sort of like, well, what makes this food delicious? Oh, well, it's packed with all of this umami. And it's like, you're not you're not actually saying anything to me. I mean, there's, I would still say they give details on why certain things work well together, why some of the ingredients take away from the sweetness, for example. That's one of the key points in one of the matches where it's like, hey, if you put this after this one, uh, this food after this one, it's going to be too sweet. And I ca I accounted for that. And then, I don't know, someone's like, no, I also accounted before <laughs> for that in in advance and did something to the food that would uh, co uh, compensate for that and stuff like that. So it's like a chess game in the kitchen. And, like, you know... Once again, 4D chess. But yeah, you're right. It's just in general, um, the la that, that particular season, or starting with the, with the central arc, the show has been also very focused on the actual shokugekis. Before mm. that, you had a nice mix of actual learning about something about food. Then had you, you had some shokugekis. You had some character development. And then you had the interjection arc with the stagiare, where they actually did an internship and actually had to learn how is it to serve, you know, a bunch of different customers and stuff like that. So yeah, it was a big bit more balanced. But this felt like okay, this is what this leads up uh, has been leading up to. So now this is all dramatic finale shokugeki everywhere and we have like this plethora of face-offs of these great cooks so we don't need to go into the rest anymore and it's only about the characters finishing up their arcs in a way and that's yeah that's what it felt like you're right there's something left by the wayside in terms of what the show did before but i didn't miss it too much at least not in this season yeah how did I you mean... feel about it yourself yeah, I mean, you're right about that. I didn't think about it in the moment, but then when he brought it up, I yeah. sort of had that, I can uh, see it. if we're going to keep food analogies, I had that fridge moment nah. <laughs> where I was like, oh yeah, he's right. <clears throat> but you but know, yet, uh, see, season four, though, the way everything came together in the end really well, and 
uh, I, you know, we get these satisfying conclusions to all these character arcs that I mm-hmm. thought was really great and left me with, you know, big dumbass smile on my face at the end of Same things. for me. We get back to that. But uh, let's return to the actual food for a moment, which is the reason, also the presentation itself. I don't think this would ever work as a manga for me, like this whole show. Like the music, the voice acting, the sound effects, all of that, uh, the artwork, the, the colors improved the presentation so much. Yeah. I can't possibly, like the food can't possibly look as shiny and delicious and black and white, in my opinion. That wouldn't, like I this show, I I don't think I could... It's, it's one of those shows where it's like, I can't even imagine enjoying that as much if I only read it as a manga instead of watching it as an anime. Like all the different pr- presentation qualities that are inherent to anime enhance this experience so much. Unless this manga got a lot of color pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, which rarely happens, I think. So I don't know. But yeah, maybe. I also like what what different things they try to do with the actual Shokogekis in this. First of all, the team aspect of it, then different strategies infused into, you know, the different battles. Like, Irina's strategy is to at least wear down the Elite 10 if they can't beat them directly, which mm-hmm. also seems to work in a way. Some contestants actually work together, which I hope would happen, you know, since the design of the team Shokogeki enables them to do that and it mixes things up, it makes it interesting. We didn't really have that before. And the soundtrack by Tetsu, uh, Tatsuya Kato is fantastic. Again, like mm. emphasizes really the heroic moments. And I really like the different themes of the characters and how they are used in this. So, yeah, presentation wise, again, this show is like, this is the best, in my opinion, just in terms of artwork, in terms of voice acting, in terms of music, in terms of everything that JC staff has to offer, mm. albeit not actually being that you know, super elaborately animated and full of Sakuga moments, obviously. But there are different kinds of Sakuga. Like, in terms of how this is presentation, how the clothes fly off the people and everything, and how (laughs) the deliciousness of the food is emphasized and conveyed, that all works in terms of how the animation does it. So, I like it. And then you add to that all the different little um, side jokes, the visual side jokes that are in the show, which are a plethora of... (laughs) Yeah. Like... Uh, I think there's one scene in, in that sword fighting thing where Soma picks up a buster sword like <sighs> during his d- during that uh, metaphorical sword fight with Saito I mentioned before pretty sure one of the uh, one of the other characters was also cosplaying as Cloud in there probably Ryo oh, man, I don't remember <laughs> I but... think so I think so I picked that out that was like ha <laughs> okay I see what you did there, show. And yeah, I I love it. Also, like I said, a lot of different side characters have cool moments, like the Aldini brothers. Mikasa turned out to be quite the MVP by supplying the gang with uh, image mock training, which was pretty cool. And, you know, there's a later part after Megumi lost uh, in another match, Irina take, takes sweet revenge for uh, for her by even naming her her um, her dish after Megumi and then winning with that. It's It's great. I thought that was super satisfying. He's like, yeah, you go. <laughs> show them what's what. And yeah, there's so many cool moments in this show that make me just smile or laugh out loud. Like when As- Azami going full Rugal by becoming a judge and then introducing Vice and Mature as his lackeys. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yes, it is that. <laughs> oh my god, I didn't even think of that until now. And of course, of course, it all culminates in this giant ass orgy of disrobing through the way of Azami's skill which is gifting which is basically when something tastes so good that he would disrobe all the other people in his vicinity have to disrobe as well have to lose their clothes clothes as well and it says it's as ridiculous as you imagine it to be and it's also fantastic and for some reason it's super satisfying to see that not in, not in a satisfying oh lots of nudes people but also yeah this is this is great this is like this is like an explosion at the end of a very engaging fight uh it's just it's not actual fire it's uh it's close flying off people so <laughs> this is how food wars works people it's just ridiculous and i really liked it and yeah i think the relationship the center relationship between erina and uh, soma and of course, Erin and, and, and her dad was done really well, and how that was developed. And I like that, like basically, Soma taunts Erina to surpass his dish because it's the only way to win. Like in the final round, like he's like, "We can't do this 
if we just try to eat, like do a good meal, I have to do my speciality, the best thing I can do, and then you try to suppress me. Because that's the only way that we can win. Otherwise, we can't beat the first and second seat of the Elite Ten. That's not possible. Mm. And it's like, yeah, you're right. And she does it. It's great. It's fucking great. So, like you said, this is by the end of season four, it felt like, hey, this is the perfect ending point of this story. Right. Everything that that we've seen so far has been kind of building up to this. These all these character arcs have been brought to a satisfying conclusion. And even though it kind of makes Arena the main character by the end of the story instead of Soma, even though he became the first seed of the Elite Ten and she became the director, but still, she kind of, becomes kind of the main character in the, in the last part. I didn't think the story would get a better, more satisfying ending than this would have been. And I think I was right. Um, I agree. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I heard from several people, like even uh, this one guy I work with who had been reading the manga. He was like, yeah, the ending's not great. And I was like, no, I'll see for myself. And after watching the fifth season. Mm. Not only that, John, they made it worse. They Did made they? it worse. It's God. worse than in the manga in a way, because, OK, let's start this. Um Okay, this was for the fourth season was great. The fourth season was fun. It ended on a really good note, and I would have been super satisfied and happy and lucky to exit the, sh the show this way. Yes, mm. you know, it's not really like the, 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 the school year is not over. We don't have a resolution to the hinted at romance between Soma and Erina, which, you know, was the main focal point. But, you know, that's something I can live with. Where it's like, yeah, may, they probably will end up uh, with each other eventually, but it doesn't really matter. Like, this is. You know, we have seen what they mean to each other in this final arc of this or in this central arc, right? This is what this will lead to. I know that. I don't see, need to see the rest. I'm right. fine with how this wrapped up. I think the story between Irina and her dad was really well done and how that related to Soma said and everything. Everything in this, uh, the, in the entire central arc was great. All right. That's a good way to end this arc. And as it turns out, the mangaka agrees with me because as I've been reading up on this on this fifth season that we're going to talk about now, he actually wanted to end the manga after the central arc. And boy, does that fucking show. <laughs> Why didn't he then? Because of mainly the thing that I just mentioned, because the romance arc between Soma and Irina was not finished and Who he didn't cares? know how to wrap that up. Who gives a shit, right? Who gives a like, fucking you, shit? You can leave things. With, you know what? No, I'll talk. I'll talk about that after. But all right, okay. Let's start with the fifth season because we have some thoughts about this. Apparently, the fifth plate is a fucking mess. It starts off fine enough with like a short start off episode where all the, basically the what are now the new elite ten have to fight against uh, all the other uh, cooks in to uh, Totsuki on 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 the beach, like to get uh, more customers than everyone else. You know, it's like, like, hey, Food Wars is back, although I watched both seasons right next to each other, so for me it wasn't like, hey, okay. It was a nice breather, more than uh, something to uh, get reacquaint, uh, reacquainted uh, with the characters. Mm. And yeah, then it goes right into another tournament arc, which here we have the basically the first problem. Having a, such a long, Shokugiki-focused arc before this, and then immediately going into another one, is a really bad idea. Yeah. Uh, we had a giant tournament arc in the second season, or at the end of the first, I'm not sure, I'm mixing up my things. But after that, we got the Stagiari arc, which broke up all that and gave us a nice breather, showed us something really different. And then we introduced the Elite 10. And then after you know a short intermission with the summer or spring festival stuff, we got to the central arc. So that was a really good way to do things and structure things to not let it get boring. Right. Doing a giant S tournament arc and then <laughs> really going into another one is not a good idea. It, it would be like if Dragon Ball arc. went from Budokai Tenkaichi, oh, straight to the next one. What? Huh? Yeah. Eh? No, Dragon Ball did it better, most definitely. You always you need a breather. We can't have the constant one on one fighting and everything, even though you know it was a team Shokugeki before, and now again it's more one on one fights. But still, apparently the anime skipped an entire arc from the manga. Which was uh, between uh, the central arc and this blue arc, 
the final arc of the of the manga. I don't know what's actually in there, but it sounds like it would be it, it, it might have been so, uh, something again like the Sagiari or something, you know, a different kind of story and not again a tournament, which uh, I would have appreciated. <laughs> so we get that, but that's not the only problem. The other problem is the new antagonist or antagonists that are introduced. The first one being kind of Soma's metaphorical brother and as it later turns out Irina's real half brother Asahi Saiba, I think is his name. Is that his name? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well that's his adopted name. Yeah. Right. So who is like this dude uh, who was basically pulled out of an orphanage by Soma's dad when he traveled the world and to learn about cooking and then left him to return to his family and now uh, Asahi has a grudge blah 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 and wants to become the strongest cook in the world and to become the strongest cook in the world because of something Soma's dad said to him he thinks he needs Erina as his wife which is also kind of pretty stupid right from the get go <laughs> kind of creepy <laughs> mm, that too but yeah that's how it starts he's like hey Kind of proposing to Erina and also we're going to meet up all at this giant as tournament the World Gourmet organization is holding where different cooks have to battle it out and then become the best chef in the world kind of which is like you know recognized by the World Gourmet organization and that's after the first episode we immediately pretty much launch into that. And an entirely new faction of villains is introduced which is uh, Noir which are these kind of underworld cooks. Or criminals, basically. They at least seem to employ poachers, and one of them kidnaps the younger of the Aldini brothers, and they look like supervillains, at least some of them. And they have, like, these special cooking equipment. One lady even uses a fucking chainsaw to carve, season, uh, to carve and season her meat. Uh, like, if the show wasn't already anime enough for you before, it definitely is now. <laughs> you know what, to be fair, though, that, that's pretty fucking metal. It is kind of metal. I like that. Like, <laughs> in general, <laughs> in general, I like the idea of noir. I thought, like, hey, this is pretty cool. Like, going even more crazy, going more anime. We have real, like, after Azami, we, you know, get a, another f an independent faction that is much, you know, even, even more evil, really. It's really evil. Like, they're actual criminals. <laughs> and they employ these weird-ass fucking instruments to, you know, there's a clown dude and, I don't know, some weird assassin dude with claws on his fingers and shit like that. I like that kind of shit. The problem is, they are so fucking throwaway. We learn nothing about any of the noir guys, really. Maybe one of them, like the girl, the, the woman with the chainsaw thing, because she has some relation to Asahi. But, but that's basically it. They are so one-note villains. It's they are kind of super boring and meaningless and pointless, and it's it's a shame. I expected more from them. I feel like even calling them like Saturday morning cartoon villains is being a little too generous. Yeah, exactly. And it's so weird. I mean, considering what I have read about the manga now, that basically the and what is so noticeable without knowing that the fourth, the fifth season rushes through the final arc of the manga at a breakneck pace. It skips so much. It goes so fucking fast. The shokugekis in this in this fifth season are so quick, they sometimes only take two minutes or something. Mm -hmm. Like one of Megumi's fights is only two minutes long, and I think she loses. It's crazy. And then Asahi is like talking to some of his noir buddies, and he's like, hey, I expect you to stop the other cooks. And then you see like a montage of them losing, which I expect in the manga were probably full-fledged uh, shokugekis for the, by themselves, and not only like this throwaway montage. <laughs> yeah, all of that makes this fifth season feel incredibly ill-conceived and way, way too superficial and way too fast. Like, there's no time to breathe. There's more shit happening and another Shokugiki and another Shokugiki. No character development whatsoever. It just moves so fucking fast and you can't get invested. You can't get fucking invested. The show basically drops all the other characters by the wayside that, or... You know, some of the fan favorite at least. And basically tries at some point only fo to focus on Soma, Asahi and Erina. And that's kind of it. And that's not what the show did before. It was very good at employing all the characters that have come before again in a way. And be it only as spect uh, spectators. But even this, there's not enough time to do that in this season. <laughs> at all. It's like, this should have at least been 24 episodes. John, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Yeah, I I don't understand this. All right, you know, I guess I do understand. 
and like budget restraints have got to be there in production schedules, but just the same, it feels like they could have spaced it out across two cores like they did, you know, the central mm. arc, and it probably would have been way better for it. <sighs> and yeah, the characters of noir are like, all right, I guess you're there. It was kind of fun to hear. Kenjiro Suda play a very very effeminate character with Don oh, Calma, yeah. but Don that Calma, was yes. that was my takeaway. Yeah, he was one of the more noticeable characters. That's true, but I assume all the other ones that were introduced in the beginning were like, hey, okay, they also have a part to play, and then Asahi steals all their uh, all their tools, and they never appear again. It's like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, what are oh, you doing, show? As soon as I put my hands on this tool, I'm an expert with it. Then why do you have everyone else? Answer and, me that. Yeah, it's it's really crazy. Like this this tournament feels so fucking rushed. I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of cool that there is no downtime between the matches. On the other hand, we are missing out on some neat character bits and development between all the Shokugekis. And the fourth plate already was battle after battle after battle in a way. Although that also had more character development than this. So this is absolute overkill. Earlier seasons were definitely much more balanced or mixed it up better. And also one of the other major problems is, character-wise, having Erina, who just spent two seasons overcoming all her psycholo uh, psychological baggage in regards to her father, immediately thrust into a state of blind competitiveness because of her mom, who turns out to be the actual final antagonist of the show, because she's the boss of the uh, World Gourmet organization, feels really unnecessary and negates a lot of what made season three and four feel so rewarding. It, like, makes, it makes it feel like... <sighs> this is going to be a, a weird take. It makes it feel like, oh, maybe Soma shouldn't have been the main character after all. Because they, yeah. they spent so much time on Airy Night, which that's fine. That's fine. But they kind of took this – after Soma became the top dog at Totski, where does his story go after that? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so having, you know – this narrative switch to Arena is like, well, why wasn't it Arena's story all along? And so much shenanigans could have been happening and you could have, you know, made his the side story and be like, okay, yeah, sure. I just, I don't, I don't understand why, why the story was told the way it was toward the end. And it, it really sort of soured it for me, man. I can understand why. I mean, I, at the let's say in the middle of the fifth season i was really mad i was really angry it's like what the fuck are you doing how is that how do you follow up your excellent third and fourth season with that <laughs> what what is happening <laughs> is this is this covid's fault what the <laughs> shit what the fuck hasn't 2020 not been bad enough already what the hell uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would say I was mad, but more just confused. Well, yeah, I didn't understand. I was confused. I mean, I I understand what, what happened, but it was like, I didn't understand the intention behind it. Why are you so fucking fast with this? And like I said, Irina had great development in the third and fourth season. And mm. having her, they kind of walk her character back. It's like, hey, she kind of overcame these feelings, these insecurities and feeling like she doesn't like she isn't good enough for her at least for one of her parents side and now they do that again with her mm. mother this time it's the same story again only done worse like you have done this much better before why do you do you need to do this again and also and also her half brother wants to marry her yeah <laughs> fuck <laughs> Well, he doesn't know at this point that he's a half-brother, to be fair. And she doesn't either. They find that out in the last episode uh, of the show. Where it's like, and to be that's fair... That's some fucking Skywalker shit, though. That's true. It is very Skywalker. It, <laughs> that is real. <laughs> that, is, that is very true. But still, I thought, like, by the, by the end, by the end, I like that the whole Nakiri family ends up under the same roof. I thought yeah. that was very nice. I thought that her mother coming back and, you know, once she actually beats Soma and stuff like that, uh, her mother coming back, her father coming back, then pulling Asai, who never really had anyone because he was an orphan, because Azami, again, shitty dad, what a surprise. They actually pull, pull him into the family and have him be part of that. And his 
his fucking uh, buddies from Noir actually shedding tears because because he's happy now. That <laughs> was very cute. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, come on, that's that's nice. Also, you said before, where do they take Soma's character? They actually give us some interesting background on his character, where it's like, hey, we're introducing his mom and shit like that. It's like, here, um, yeah, here's, sure. you know, here's the actual reason his dad got back to cooking. Here's the actual reason that Soma improved. They extend on that in this season, which is good. The problem is they don't take any time for that. Mm. They rush through that as well. And if they've taken like at least a couple of episodes to do a whole mini arc on Soma's background and his family story with his mom and his dad, which is a good story, which is very, which could have been very emotionally rewarding. The problem is there's so little time spent on that in this season. It's barely mentioned that once you get to the actual payoff for that, which could have been a really, really good payoff, really good payoff if it had time to breathe. You don't really feel that much about it. It's like, oh, okay, that's how it happened. But if they have taken the actual time to let that simmer and make that connect better to Erina's story, which it does, and how their story, their romantic relationship, where that adds up, it would have been much more satisfying. And just on the, due to the sh this final season being so incredibly rushed, it is not. It feels very lackluster. It feels very shallow. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a super bummer because there was so much potential here and i th maybe in the manga it's more satisfying maybe they take more time for that and i'm not gonna read the manga for this like i said this is this show works for me because it is an anime and i don't think it would have worked for me as well as a manga and it's a shame that they at least couldn't have like taken the time and given this final arc the gravitas it needed to have instead of rushing through it and it really feels like they were trying to go the uh, the same route that Symphogear uh, XV tried to go with the this is what we have been building up to and look everybody is here you know there are a lot of minor characters from earlier seasons coming back as spectators or as judges or as food tasters whatever in this season there are a lot of you know old faces returning and shit like that and everyone all of the characters are in the, uh, that have been here before are suddenly in the season like everyone is watching Soma's final match and everything and it's cool it would have been cooler if you take some time <laughs> to actually let us enjoy this and not mm. fucking rush through it at fucking light speed. And, like I said before, a bunch of the stuff they're showing us in this feels like a rehash. Like, for example, the gifting returns, but we have seen it before. So it doesn't pack as much of a, a ridiculous punch as it did in at the end of the fourth season, because it was new then. Now it's just bigger, and they combine it with another thing, but it's not like, whoa, holy shit, this is ridiculous. It's but like, it's no, I've seen this before. But it's the true gifting. Mm, gifting, and the, what was it, the bursting or something like that? I think so. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, okay, I've seen this before. You can't wow me with that anymore. Yeah. And we constantly get a feeling, yeah, we've seen this. In fact, we have seen exactly this in the previous season both in terms of Shoko Gigakis and in terms of character development. It's kind of a lot of the fourth season done again, only worse mm. and way too fast. And that's a bummer. I liked how this fifth season wrapped up. I just wish the road to getting here wasn't so goddamn rough. And it would have been much more emotionally rewarding if they took their time and told this, the story at least uh, as it was in the manga, which they didn't do. And again... It would have served the show the best if they just ended after the fourth season. I agree. A hundred percent. Season five just feel it feels tacked on. Yeah, it absolutely. feels like it doesn't need to be there. I mean, again, I'm trying not to be completely negative. For example, I'm picking out moments here. Making Soma win because Asai actually is just copying and mixing the flavor of all the cooks he beat instead of having his own personal flavor is actually kind of clever. Mm. Would have been more interesting and more weighty if we'd spent more time with Asahi. There was more time spent on him in the manga. That's what I read. So we're kind of missing out on that. In the anime, he's just a creepy loudmouth. <laughs> so there's that. And he's, yeah. In the anime, he's about two and a half steps away from just going full Lelouch v. Lampe Rouge. Thanks, yeah, Fukuyama. <laughs> absolutely and i don't know if i actually like that all of this was the master plan of Irina's grandfather to help her and her mother overcome their curse Ugh. but it makes the whole thing feel appropriately ridiculous so maybe i like it i'm not sure it kind of fits but again 
if the show had more time, if the season had more time to breathe, this would have felt even cooler or, you know, even more ridiculous. Or it's like, hey, this is all, this is what what this really has been leading up to. This is, this is, this has come full circle, right? Mm. And I got more of that feeling at the end of the fourth season than at the fifth season. So, I don't know. Like you said, this felt tacked on. This, even though the ending kind of brings everything to a nice close, it's it's unnecessary. It's like, hey, if you won't do it right, why do it at all, right? Right. Where's the point? Get a bit more money out of the Blu-rays? What, what the fuck? If you already said that you would want to end it after Central, end the anime after Central. And if you're like, okay, we need to adapt the full manga, then adapt the full manga! And not only a part of the rest of, of the story. It makes no sense. Like you, you went the worst way. So, and uh, you, you mentioned the epilogue manga before. Half of that apparently is in the last episode. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. So they already used that up in a way. Mm. I don't think that we will get more out of that. Mm. Also, there was this weird bit. Megumi several times refers to a shokugeki they had while she and Soma, I think, were traveling certain parts of Japan or something and fought this guy called Monarch. Did that happen in a movie or an OVA? It felt like they were referring to to something that was actually animated somewhere outside of the series. So I was like, was was there something like that? I mean, I think there were a couple or three OVAs, but I, I don't think I ever watched those ones. Okay, so it probably was one of them. I was just confused because it was talking about it like, hey, you, you remember that, that fight? And I was like, no, I don't. What the fuck? <laughs> Where's that from? Apparently there's like five OVAs. Well, how about that? Well, okay. So one of them probably covers that then. I mean, that probably need that they do a callback to that. We would have needed to watch the OVAs then, but all right. Okay, but at least I know then where that is probably from. That's something. But yeah, it's a bummer. It's just a bummer. It really, really shows that the creator of this, Tsukuda, wanted to end the manga originally after the central arc. Because like John said, this is where it feels like that's the natural ending point of the story. Even mm-hmm. not all of the character arcs really have been wrapped up or, you know, the kids are still in school, whatever. It definitely feels like Hey, this is where the characters were trying to go. This is where they are now. Irina has a satisfying end to her story. And yeah, the romance is not wrapped up, but who gives a shit? It makes much more sense. Also, Soma disappears for six months because... Training! Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And then he comes back and Irina's all head over heels for him. It's like, fucking get out of here. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that was Get really weird. Get out of here! I was not only longing for your food, but also for your heart or something like this. But Jesus fucking Christ! <laughs> that like, line! That's, like, that's not the character you wrote. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's It kind of sells so short. Uh, you're right. I Ugh. still like, you know, the the uh, the end where, uh, like, the end, the end, type, uh, end, end screen where everyone... Uh, where the voice actor of Soma says say no and then everybody says also oh, not mm. uh, that was yeah. a nice thing I would have liked to have that at the end of the fourth se- <laughs> of the fourth season it would have been perfect it would have been fucking perfect end of Food Wars I'm like okay alright sure that's and, that's a great ending that's how and, you do it and you know the final episode being called Just Food Wars it's like here's your full circle episode name I was like well I, I, I can't hate that yeah that's true Right? Would have been nice if that would have been the title uh, of the last episode of the fourth season. Yes! Yeah, that's, ah! that's, that's where that belongs. <laughs> Goddamn. Yeah, it's a bummer because both of us really enjoyed Food Wars up to this point. It's really sad when a series doesn't stick the landing. And this one didn't. And that's, that's a shame. It did stick the landing one season before that. So yes, it did. You... God, the ending of season four was so good. Yes. So here's the thing. Don't watch the fifth season. Just watch <laughs> season one through four, and that's the end of Food Wars for you. Season that's it. Got index three. Yeah, exactly. Just like okay, just ignore that there's a fifth season. Just ignore that the manga continued. Just like I do with Psychopaths on a regular basis. <laughs> there is only one season of Psychopaths. There are only four seasons of Food Wars, and that's it. And that's that's my final word on this and i won't accept any other opinion of this just just draw that line in the sand right now exactly i'll die on that hill but yeah it's it's a bummer 
this could have been this could have been done i mean if if the season would have given more time if the, if if it would have been done well like give a 24 episode to adapt the other arc that was between the central and the blue arc have the show have uh, as a whole maybe another 36 episodes or something then this probably would have felt more satisfying and good. St- the introduction, late time introduction of uh, Irina's mom and Noir would still have feel kind of, felt kind of ham-fisted and everything and w- would have been unnecessary. All of this was unnecessary, but still it wouldn't have felt so misplaced and so ill-conceived and so badly constructed and rushed and everything. And that's how it felt now. And no castle disrobing helps us over this and <laughs> no learning about so how soma got his scar and none of that really gave us the payoff we wanted from the finale of food wars mm. we kind of got that in the fourth season so yeah i guess that's both of our final uh, word on this watch fourth season of food wars and then be done with it because then you will have a satisfying conclusion and can finish up this series, this great series, mostly great series, with a feeling of satisfaction and feel like you've eaten a great fucking meal. And that is a wrap on the 103rd episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to vrt.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for a review index and more. Leave us comments and questions on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze or send an email to animebrainfreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in, we hope you had a good time and please join us again on our next episode. Macht's gut. So long, everybody. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. A conundrum of comedic cons. How much further does the rabbit hole go? It doesn't stop. Why won't it stop? I won off Kawahara's wild ride. <laughs>